Father, I thank you that you would help us understand and mind in the beginning things that are going to matter in the end. That you would make us aware of things now, things in the beginning, things in our life, things that need to change now that are going to matter down the road. That we would nip those little foxes, like I said, shoot them, choo, 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 choo. set them on fire, send them into a field, just get them out of here, lest they spoil the vine. Lord, I thank you that truth is magnificent, it's wonderful, it's lovely. Oh, precious is the flow. When we were singing that, I had a picture of Jesus who said, I'll be in them like a fountain. Jesus said, I'll be in them like a fountain springing up. And I got this picture of his blood springing up inside of me. I got a picture of his blood springing up inside of me and coursing through my every fiber of my being. I mean, like, because we say, like, the blood of Jesus has cleansed us and washed us clean. Well, he didn't just clean us on the outside. He cleaned us on the inside. Where our soul can be clean, where our mind, our will, our emotions can be completely washed free and clean from all the junk that we grew up with. And that you would help us to maintain that clean conscience. I think it's 2 Corinthians 1.12. It says our testimony is this. We conducted ourselves with godly sincerity. We maintained a clean conscience. So powerful. You, know, you have a picture of Lot he talked about Lot. And he said that, that Lot, you know, his, his righteous soul was tormented because of the acts of the people around them. And it's Old Testament. And, and you know, Lot is in this town. He's in Sodom and Gomorrah. And it's horrible. The acts that are happening all around them. Yet Lot, his soul was tormented on a constant basis. And there is a place for us to be in Christ, in Jesus so where the reality of that stuff doesn't torment our soul because our soul is fixed upon Him. Because the New Testament reality is different. It's where Christ came to live inside of us instead of God being around us. Christ in us is the hope of glory. A fountain springing up. Christ in us. The Holy Spirit in us. The anointing in us that makes us a Christian. That is inside of us protecting us and guarding us. And not on defense but on offense. Because that fountain that springs up inside of us is supposed to flow out of our belly like rivers of living water. Because it's Christ in us that's the hope of glory. It's Christ coming out of us that's the manifestation of that very glory of Jesus everywhere we go. Where we can manifest Christ. But it needs to be manifested through a pure heart and clean hands. Where we don't have some kind of weird agenda. It's not about who sees you pray for somebody. Although it's awesome when other believers see that you're boldness and you step out. But if you need them to see you, then you're doing it for performance. And you're doing it to get attention for yourself. And it's not about attention for yourself. It's about giving Jesus your full undivided attention on a constant basis. Where your eyes can be fixed on that single vision and that one thing that he paid a price for us to live in. You alright? Yeah. I know, like, every session is heart surgery, dude. It's powerful. I want to talk about it again and again and again. And I want to talk about the effect that it has on our surroundings too. Because we don't have to be affected by our surroundings. We can infect our surroundings. But you need to know who you are and what you carry. And you need to understand that Jesus said that you're going to be persecuted for this very thing that we're talking about. Because not everybody believes that you can be right with God. Not everybody believes that God's called us to be saints instead of sinners. Not everybody believes that God's called you to be holy. People have put it out there. And, then, and because people have messed it up and tried to put yokes and bondages upon people. And tried to make them perform a set of rules that's impossible for them to follow. Religion. That's capsized people. And so all of a sudden when you come out of that religious camp. And, and you've grown up in religion. All of a sudden when you hear this kind of teaching. It almost has a tendency to try to like. Jog your memory of what you grew up with. And you don't want anything to do with it. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the beauty of holiness. I'm talking about the beauty 
of Christ in you, the hope of glory. This has nothing to do with religion, because religion, it is impossible for you to walk this out in a religious manner. And pure religion is this, actually. So if we're on that subject a little bit, it's caring for orphans and widows. Now watch. We could say orphans are just like people without parents. And we could say orphans are the body of Christ without a father. The pure religion is this. Helping to inspire the body of Christ that thinks like an orphan so they can see what sonship is. Come to the father. But what's a widow? A widow is one that doesn't have a husband. And I've betrothed you to one husband, he says. And I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So orphans could be the body of Christ that doesn't have a father. And a widow is a bride that doesn't understand she's married. And the purity of the gospel is the reality of keeping yourself unspotted from the world. That's pure religion right there. And that's amazing. So if you want to be religious, go after that one. It says, blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness. We talked about it earlier. I talk about it every day of my life. But they shall be filled. So if you position your focus to go after the reality of right standing with God. First we start with poor in spirit. Then we go into meek. Then we go into blessed are those that mourn. I'm mourning because I have a depth inside of my heart that can only be satisfied with more of Him. And I'm thankful that I have what I have, but I am not satisfied with where I'm at. And content with who I am in God, who God is in me. There's so much more that I'm not aware of that I need, and that causes me to mourn. And cry out with groanings and deep groaning inside of my heart. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. That shall be filled is amazing because it's keep filling, keep filling, keep filling, keep filling. And the more I go after it, the more I realize how right he has made me be with Him. Not that I've done anything, because all of my righteous acts are as filthy rags to the Father if I'm trying to get in there myself. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through Him. This is so amazing and so ridiculous. It's grace. Grace is so powerful, it's so lovely. Grace is, the, grace is the fuel that fills your motor, that enables you to run right. Grace is God's willingness to forgive you, God's willingness to empower you, God's willingness to love you despite yourself. And when your eyes hook up with that reality of that, your eyes of your understanding open up, all of a sudden you're birthed into the hope of your calling. You're called to be sons and daughters, just like your dad. And he's okay with you. And grace is so powerful because it's God's, God accepts me just the way I am. But grace demands change because any grace that doesn't need the transformation is demonic. Grace in its own nature is transforming. Grace comes from God. God expects us to be transformed. We are supposed to be transformed, moving from faith to faith. We are supposed to be transformed, moving from glory to glory. We all with unveiled face behold in a mirror as in, that we behold as in a mirror. We behold the glory of the Lord. And we move from faith to faith, glory to glory. Grace is transforming. The spirit of grace that empowers truth to happen. We move from glory to glory. And every time I look in the mirror, I see Jesus staring back at me. There's not a question. No question. I didn't do anything to get him to come. All I did was say yes. My big yes outweighs Satan's ability to deceive me through his lies. Because my big yes to God means that I've completely surrendered to the word of truth. And I'm going to go after what God says about me for eternity. I can't afford to live less than this. Because what I'm doing, if I do live less than that, I'm living less than the hope of my calling. God desires to give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Him 
so that everywhere we go, we know who we are and whose we are. And everybody around us gets highly infected by what we've been affected by. If it's our, if it's our afflictions that hinder us, if it's these affections that hinder us, we can cause our affections to be fixed and focused upon the reason we're on the earth. And the overseer, the shepherd, the overseer of our souls comes and teaches us that we're sheep. Bah! <laughs> my sheep will hear and obey my voice and the strangers, they will not follow. You are commanded. That's not a request. That's a command. It's a command to not follow the stranger's voice. It's a command. My sheep will hear and obey my voice and the strangers will they will not follow. Any voice that you hear that limits God is demonic. Because He's not limited. He's unlimited. And it's grace that enables you to understand what the limitations are. And there are none. Are you okay? It's quiet. I don't even hear fireworks going off anymore. Yes, it will be talk. Okay. There's my fireworks. All right. You guys know who Jonathan David Helzer, Melissa Helzer are? I did a conference with them. They were doing worship for me. Oh. She has a song called Explode My Soul. This thing, just bonkers, gone, ridiculous. Focused on the reality of who he calls me to be. Nothing infiltrates him. All right, you gotta play, bro. You're amazing. Come on, it helps. Thank you. Oh, or put it in a loop or something, I love it. It sounds so good. I love you, man. Really, really. I was telling, telling um, Catherine today that it's really good to come to a house to where we're on the same page. But sometimes I go to houses and my message is contra it's very controversial to their belief system. And I like that too. It doesn't matter. I love Jesus, no matter what. It doesn't matter who's in front of me, because I'm not there to cater to anybody but my fault. I'm there to bring the reality of the love of God to you, whether you believe it or not. You will when I'm done. I just, I, I'm consumed and possessed by it. And I preach my life, because He is love, and He loves me. He loved me so much that when I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And when He loved me then, when I was an enemy of God, how much more would He freely give me all things? good things, all of them. But what I ask for when I go into a house is that they would be possessed by the love of God and get wrecked for nothing else except that. They would be overwhelmed by His goodness, His mercy, His grace. All right. Let's figure somewhere to go. You could go anywhere. Let's just go to 1 Peter 2. That's really good. Love it. If you don't have a Bible, you should have one. If you don't believe in having a Bible and listening to everybody else, you'll be deceived for the rest of your life. Don't be deceived. Learn from God. Learn straight from your Father. And if you think it's not working, do it again. You say, well, I read and I just didn't get it. Your brain's not meant to learn. Your heart is. And your heart will be overwhelmed with His goodness. And there will be stuff that's put inside of you. And it will give you a warmth in your heart. Because it's going in there. You might not be able to explain it. Don't study your Bible to teach. Study your Bible so you can become what it says. Don't read your Bible. Say, man, I need another sermon. I need. I have to have something to say. So I'm just going to read this to something to say. Don't do that. Open this book up and say, God, this is who you say I am. Make this me. Don't just put it on your head. Put it in your heart. Don't just rest it on your, on your chest. Put it in your ears. Put it before your eyes. Study to show yourself approved. Rightly divide the word of truth and don't play with this thing. 
Don't be deceived and don't be swayed by every wind of doctrine that just comes through. There's lots of people that are very eloquent speakers. There's deception that's out there right now. And if you're just looking for a good teacher, a good speaker, be sucked in just like that, man. You be very careful. Make sure that you're sucked into his goodness and his grace and his mercy and his love. And make sure that the blood of Jesus is always the focal point. Because it's all about Christ. It's all about it. It'll always be about Jesus. You make Jesus your fore, your fore focus, your, your forefront, your focus, your every thought, every, every thought. You be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You don't be conformed to the world. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove God's will in every area of life. Don't be a slave to sin. Be a slave unto righteousness. Run a race that's set before you. Live a life that's worthy of the call. And don't just live the way you want to live. Live the way that he says you can live because there's life in that. Don't be swept up in the junk, man. Your conscience is your filter. And the blood of Jesus cleans the conscience. It becomes a clean filter. And it catches trash. It catches stuff that's not okay. I gave the example of in my hotel room. I look out the window when I'm, when I'm working out at the gym. And there's these two backhoes that are taking out dirt. There's one that's really down low with a dumpster right beside it. And it's taking dirt on the bottom and it's putting it in the dumpster. And there's another one way up top that's taking that dirt and throwing it out. And when the world comes and tries to make you dirty and tries to make you polluted, realize that you have the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And with the Word, He takes that dirt up out so that you have an empty dumpster. You don't have to live or think like trash. It says, therefore lay aside all malice, all deceit, Gosh, we should go through. I read this today, didn't I? Oh, I don't know, but it's amazing. It says, be holy for I am holy, Peter says. In 1 Peter 1, it says, since you purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is grass, the flower, and the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. This is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Therefore, lay aside all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, all evil speaking. And as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. And come to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You, as living stones, are to be built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore it said, also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion, the chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they also were appointed. But you, as a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now are a people. Look, it's no in-between. You are people of God who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Therefore, beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, a pilgrim and a sojourner is one that's passing through, that doesn't live there, but they're there. You guys are passing through. We're wandering through this world, not wandering around the desert, not wandering around the wilderness, but we are here. We're in the world, but not of it. We have to have our minds set on things above and not on things beneath. We have to not be dominated and controlled and manipulated by situations around us. But we have to have the love of Christ that's dwelling within us compel us. That if one died, then all died. That those that live should not ever live for themselves, but live for the one that gave himself for them. That's the gospel that we've enlisted into. I beg you, sojourners and pilgrims, 
abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. So you have the same picture almost. Lot was, his soul was, was, was violated because of what was outside. Because of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah and the horrible tragedy and all the mess, he tormented his righteous soul. But now it's not torment, it's just warring. But you war from a different place. You're not warring on defense because it's against your soul. You're warring on the offense because Jesus is within your soul. It's different. You don't entangle yourself in this stuff, but you're warring according to the truth of what God says to war with. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, taking every thought into captivity. Every thought that rises itself up, that tries to exalt itself up against the knowledge of God, you are required by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to take that thing captive, harness that so that truth can remain. Every thought that comes against your soul, that wars against your soul, you are a warrior, but your war is different than being tormented. The only way you can be tormented right now in this world when stuff is around you is you not understanding who you are and how you're supposed to war. You are not on defense. We are not protecting ourselves from being dirty. We are clean and we clean when we walk. You can't afford to have this thing up for sale and up for grabs. You have to live a life worthy of the calling. Living a life worthy of the calling. See, it talks about it in Philippians. It's so powerful. What worthy of the call. It says that you are supposed to shine in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation. You are to shine as lights in the Lord. Let your light so shine that they might glorify your Father in heaven because of the good works that come out of you. It's not you being intimidated by what's around you. It's being compelled by the Christ that's in you. It's falling in love with the shepherd and overseer of your souls so that you can be completely possessed by his grace which empowers his truth. And you can change the world around you because of the Christ that's in you. Because you're not just in this for you. You're in this for others. You're not just in this for you to get to heaven. If you position yourself in that place, you will look at the world and how twisted it is, just like Lot did. It was twisted, and God rescued him, and he destroyed that. He destroyed that whole city. See, we say, well, that was God then. That's not happening now. Read Jude. Read some stuff. It was an example for those that desire to live ungodly. He's talking about the church that confesses to know God, living ungodly. That's not, that's not healthy and that's not happy. A healthy church is amazing. We've got, the, we've got the ability to infect our surroundings. We've got the ability to completely transform our surroundings because of what lives within us. God who wills to do according to his good pleasure. And it's according to the power within us. Christ in us. He wants to do, he wants to give you exceedingly above anything you could ask or think. What if you ask him to know him? What if he wants to give you way more than you could ask for? What if he wants to give you way more than you could ever pray for? But what if your prayer was to ask God to know him more. What if you would seek him in the secret place? What if you would go into the secret place instead of asking God for stuff, you would just ask him for him? What if you'd go in that place and seek him for him? And then when you're in the open, he'd just reward you with him in the open. How powerful would that be? What would it be like for him to reward you with himself in the open? What if he's your reward? What if he's your portion? What if that's it? What if we're just missing it on that one? What if we just harness our, our soul into that place? And fix our focuses. It's called love. Ugh. Have your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil, when they speak against you as an evildoer, 
that they, by your good works, which they observe. Man, it's not like sometimes when people see your good works, they're not like, wow, that was a great work. No, they speak evil about you. It's not like when someone's speaking evil about you and you do something kind, man, they're like, they're waiting for you to break. They're not waiting for you to stand. When people persecute you and say all kinds of mean things about you falsely for his name's sake, it's a blessing for you. Great is your reward. So they persecuted and, and they persecuted and reviled the prophets before you. Great is your reward in heaven. But we're not looking for our reward in heaven. I don't give so that I can get. I'm not sowing into people so that I can receive. I don't give to people so God gives me more. No, there's a never ending source that bubbles up. He is revelation. He is the wisdom and revelation just keeps coming and coming and coming. I did not plan what to say to you tonight. And I don't bless people financially and sow into waiters so that God gives me more. That's twisted. That means I'm giving in order to get. I don't bless people and sow into people's lives financially so that God gives me more. That's weird. I'm, I'm giving to get. You give because that's what love does, man. You just give because that's what love does. Now you can't outgive God, but don't get it confused. Because if you give and then the time measurement that you've given God to give you back doesn't happen, then all of a sudden you'll think God didn't answer that one. But it's impossible for you to outgive God. But God wants you to offer your body as a living sacrifice. Everything about you, from head to toe, you are a living sacrifice, period. From top to bottom, man. And God wants to sanctify you completely. The God of peace wants to sanctify you completely. Spirit, soul, and body. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake whether to the king as supreme or to governors as to those who are sent by him for punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free yet not using your liberty as a cloak for a vice, but as bond servants of God honor all people. That doesn't mean honor just church people. That means honor all people. Love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Yeah, but our king is ungodly. That doesn't mean that you're not supposed to honor him. See, we think that we give honor to people because they deserve it. Boy, if you want what you deserve, go to hell. Because that's just not how it works. Grace is giving to somebody that doesn't deserve it. Because when they don't deserve it and you give it and they, and they are mean to you because you gave it to them, oh, and it doesn't rattle you, to them it's a sign of perdition. To them, it's a sign of somebody that's sold out. I told you a testimony when I first came here. I think I did. Pretty sure it was on my way here. I'm on so many planes, man. I think it was. I got on the plane, I sat beside a business, man. And he said, um, do you mind after we, after we get off the ground, can we switch seats because my family's over there? And I said, sure, I think, I think I'll be okay. He said, oh, thank you. And I started sharing my testimony with him. He starts crying, starts freaking out. What? Oh, God, the last time I was on a plane, there was two other people. Oh, God, no, no, no not again, not again. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with him? Please leave me alone. Please leave. Please. I said, I can't, sir. See, I was lost. I shared my testimony with him. And now I'm found. He said, just, don't, just talk to some other one. Talk to the other one. All right, your family's over there. You want me to talk to them? <laughs> no, God, no, God. He's trapped. Done. What do you do? See, I could sit there and say, wow, I don't want to offend this guy. But my heart is so burning that I don't want him to head to hell. Then I'm not willing to compromise this gospel for anybody. 
So then, finally, we're quiet for a little bit. He's like, do you think I could switch seats with you? I said, yeah. I said, but I'm just telling you this. I'm going to be talking to the flight attendants about Jesus and witnessing so I can either do it to them in the aisle or over top of you. So you choose. Oh, God, I just don't want to talk about this anymore. I said, you see, sir, you've met a sold out Christian, one that's not afraid. You've met one today. You've met a Christian that has given his life wholly and completely to God. And your salvation matters to me. Oh, just stop talking. I can't, sir. I love you. Just, just leave me alone. Please leave me. I said, all right, I'll leave you alone. But I promise you this. You've met a Christian that won't ever stop praying for you, so you're going to come to Jesus. Regardless if it's today or tomorrow, you will not get out of this. I promise. See, I believe it's impossible for somebody's free will that's dominated by lies and principalities to dominate my free will that's possessed by truth and knows that it's God's will that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of Him. I believe it's impossible for an unbeliever to get out of it if a Christian would understand who they are, their created value, the one that paid a price for them. I believe it's impossible for the people around you to get out of this. I don't care how horrible they are right now. Jesus is bigger than that. Your war is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and, and it's against powers and principalities, demonic strongholds spiritual hosts of wickedness that have possessed the reality of their thinking. It's demonic thinking. The only reason they think what they think is because they believe hellish ways, hellish thinking. Now, since when did this free will teaching teach us that their free will to boast against the, to boast against the truth because they believe a lie and have no ability to see the truth? Since when did that dominate a believer's free will that's possessed by the very one truth that it's God's will that all men be saved and all come to the knowledge of truth? We've allowed free will to, well, you know, it's their will. And we stop praying for them. What are you doing? Lock hold of them. Don't let them go. Well, that doesn't mean that you're praying for everybody every day that you remember because there's a man who's, gosh, I meet people every day. Father, I thank you for all the people that I've sowed seeds in. God, I thank you that I'm not the only Christian out there. God, I thank you for the privilege of being a seed sowing machine, God. I thank you, Father, that I've watered where others are sowed. God, I thank you that you would bring the increase. Don't let them go, Father. They mean so much to you. God, I thank you. Not let, give them no rest in their soul till they surrender. Well, that's me. No. You don't, they don't have any rest in their soul anyway. Just adding to it. I think I could preach all night, dude. You keep going. Bro, that's awesome. You're amazing. Oh. Read that last script, the last two scriptures, verse 18. Servants, be, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God. Look at that. Listen to that. For this is commendable. If because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. In other words, you're suffering for doing good. It says this. For what credit is it if you're beaten for your faults and you take it patiently? But when you do good, and suffer. See, righteousness provokes acts of goodness. Righteousness, right standing with God, actually provokes your heart to do good. Jesus went about doing good 
and healing all. Jesus, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, who went about doing good and healing all. So he did good and he healed all. So God anoints you of Brisbane, or wherever you're from, so that you can go about doing good. So do good for righteousness sake and heal all because that's part of the package. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us. Listen to this example, man. This is ridiculous. Ephesians 5 says, therefore be an imitator of God, dear children, and walk in love, even as Christ has. And then this right here. Now, you keep, please keep in mind that this is coming from Peter. I just love it. Like, I look at this and I'm like, man, if there's anybody on the earth that would have a revelation of this right here, or Paul, if there's anybody that would have a revelation of this, it'd be them. I mean, Paul persecuted and crushed Christians, dude, killed them. And then God showed mercy on him, bang, and he wrote 13 of the books that we read. And you've got Peter, who really, really messed up. I mean, really messed up. For to this you were called. So this is your call, right here. You were called to this. Because Christ also suffered for us. Actually, the original says, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow his steps. Listen to his steps that you're to follow. Whoa. Who committed no sin. His steps are that you commit no sin. Oh, now you've done it. No, no, no. The Bible did it. It's here. It's right here. He said this. Be an imitator of God. This is your invitation right here. Boom. Your invitation to walk like Jesus, who committed no sin, nor was there deceit found in his mouth. And when he was reviled, he didn't revile in return. And when he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously, who suffered for our sins in his own body on a tree, that we, having died to sin, died to sin, dead to sin, might live unto righteousness. What truth, what liberation, what freedom, what a breath of fresh air that you're supposed to breathe. Breath of God, <laughs> breathe into people so that you can jump up a man of God again. Stop letting sin so easily ensnare you. Stop letting that stuff ensnare you. How shall we escape? How shall we escape if we neglect such great a salvation as this? Salvation isn't just get me out of here and get me to heaven. Salvation is get you in here. Jesus, boom! Salvation of your soul is the finishing of your faith. We read it today. Your soul. Purify your soul. Receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions to fix this thing so that you think different, so that you see different, so that you hear different, so that you don't hear with the ears of accusation. Not everybody's talking about you. You ever heard it in the world? You got a guilty conscience. Did you ever hear anybody say that? I lived with that my whole life because my conscience was guilty. I was guilty of horrible things, which led to more horrible things. But when you got a clean conscience, you don't think that everybody's talking about you. And if they are, you bless them. Did you ever meet anybody like that? I know nobody's in here like that, but did you ever meet anybody like that? Where you think everybody's talking about you? Someone's looking at you, oh, they're probably thinking this and this. It's childish. It's pre-born again. It's pre-Christ thinking. It doesn't matter what they think about you. What matters is what your father thinks about you and what he says about you. 
Because when you see that, you know whose you are. And when you're reviled and persecuted, you don't revile and persecute it in return. Bless. Persecute it for righteousness' sake. Bless those that persecute you. Actually, when it comes, you bless. It means you're living godly. Wow. I think I just got born again again. <laughs> I love this. This is like ridiculous. He says to follow his steps. Who committed no sin. How could I follow that step? Because I could live with a son consciousness and be conscious of my sonship instead of conscious of my sinship. Because God took me out of here and put me in here. It's not legalism. It's intimacy. Relationship. It's obedience. Because the love of God compels us. Go to 2 Timothy with me. Oh man, it's just everywhere. You can't get away from it. I mean, you could try, but it's my job to make you read your Bible through this lens. Who writes standing with God? Because when you start to read through there, everything shifts, everything changes. Communion. Actually, it's just electrolytes. It's <laughs> you, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Jesus. And the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You, therefore, must endure, must share hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers that endure the hardship. For no one engaged in warfare. What kind of warfare are we in? Spiritual warfare. But spiritual warfare isn't shadow boxing with the enemy. That's not warfare at all. We don't fight as one beats the air, guys. We fight from the position of righteousness. We fight from the position of the righteousness that he's made us become. We do not fight to get it. We fight from it. We don't live towards victory. We live from victory. We don't live towards heaven. We live from heaven. We set our mind on things above and not beneath. We repent. We're looking at things from the top floor or heaven's view. From God's perspective. So that we can see with the eyes of the Lord. Ah. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him. Who enlisted him do you know that jesus always did the things that pleased his father do you know that we're supposed to be an imitator of that we are supposed to always do the things that please our father and they only come from you knowing that you've been made right with your father because the fruits of righteousness are holiness oh. And also, if anybody competes in athletics, he's not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. There we are, rules. We got two. Love the Lord thy God with all my heart, my strength, my soul, and my mind. And the second one's like it. Second rule, royal law of liberty. Number two, love my neighbor as myself. They're pretty hard. Consider what I say. And may the Lord give you understanding in all these things. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. My gospel. Personal, man. It becomes your gospel when you see your creative value and you realize that the gospel is good news and the good news is righteousness. And righteousness has set up its home inside of you. So it becomes your gospel that you live with and you live from. And you represent Jesus in a lost and dying world. And you give people hope because of Christ in you. The hope of glory. Because they see your life. And they see that you're not rattled when people make fun of you. 
<laughs> For which I suffer, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of change. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Mm -mm -mm. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. I have so many hundreds and hundreds and probably thousands of testimonies that come out of what I'm preaching right now. Last time I was here was in January, and then we did another conference out in LA at Chase Church. When I got picked up from the airport for that conference, I was actually coming down a very, very, you think you have traffic here. Yeah. Five? I don't know. I don't know what the route is, but it's six lanes of stop. <laughs> but I'm in the car with my buddy. Brian, Barcelona. I'm in the car with him, and I'm like, man, look at these motorcycles, dude. They're cruising. They, it's dangerous what they're doing right now. Because the motorcycles just go in between and just go. They're just gone. And I'm like, man. God protect them. Mercy. All of a sudden, boom, a biker gets run over. Truck pulls over right in front of the biker. Boom, he's down. Big, huge biker guy. Tattoos everywhere. I can't sit in the car. I need to be in that right now. Doesn't matter. I'm not in a hurry to get nowhere. People are always in a hurry to get nowhere. I run up on this scene, and he's on the ground. There's a business guy that's standing there in front of him, kind of like he's got his you know, business stuff on. He's for the afternoon. It's on the way home. He's like stopping people from running this guy over, you know? Just like there's nobody else there, just this one guy. And I mean, I know it just happened. I run up on the scene, and this guy's on the ground. And he's like, Aah! I mean, he's a big blood-covered biker, man, angry, and I look down, and his ankle is twisted the whole way backwards. His knee is forward, and his ankle is backwards. That causes a lot of pain, shock, all that stuff. I mean, I've never had that happen, but it was nasty. I ran up to the guy, and I said, hey, he's what? He didn't want to talk to me. I said, do you know Jesus, man? Do you know Jesus? He ha I, he, I have to know that he does because I don't know how severe everything is. Where's the sold out Christian at? Where's the one that's given himself completely to this? Where's the one that's not in it for him, but in it for, for him? Where's the one that's given themselves completely, that's not afraid to get messy in life? Where's the one that's not influenced by his surroundings, but is one that will influence his surroundings because of Christ in him, the hope of glory? You see it all the time. Guaranteed. You guys weren't there yet. The ambulance people weren't there yet. Paramedics weren't there, but I was. I said, do you know Jesus? He says, what the blank are you talking? I said, you heard me, man. Do you know Jesus, man? He goes, why are you asking me? I said, because I need to know right now, you need to talk to me. Yes, I'm blanking God, Jesus. <laughs> I get down on him and I grab his hand. He's covered with blood. What are you going to do? You might get something. I will not live in fear. I will not be afraid. None go with me, I will go. Because he's with me. I am not afraid. I am never going to die. One day I'll put off this tent. But to live is Christ and to die is gain. And you will not talk me out of this. 
And you cannot reject me because you did not accept me. God accepted me. So you can never take away what you never gave me. And I will not bow to circumstances. Circumstances will bow to me and my king. Real life situation, man. And I'm holding his hand. And he says, yeah, I got Jesus. I said, man, come on. I'm going to hold you. And I'm going to pray for you, man. And I'm going to stay here with you right now. Look at me. Don't look. Look at me. And I'm talking to him. You think, trying to keep him out of shock. No. I'm peering right into his soul and bringing the reality of my king into his life. Right now. He loves you, man. No matter what you think, he loves you. It doesn't matter what you thought about your life before today. Right now, God loves you, and I'm here to tell you how much he loves you. I love you, man. I'm so glad that I came up on you right now. Me too. He is freaking out. I said, are you a father? How can I be a father? Look at my ankle. I said, what does your ankle have to do with your heart? Do you love Jesus, man? It's time now. Do you love him? Yeah. Good. Then you've got a good, good daddy that will teach you how to be a good, good daddy. You're an amazing father. And I spoke into him as a son of God. Now a cop comes, LAPD. He comes up on the scene. Big police officer, man. Comes up, he goes... Who the blank are you? Get the blank away. I said, absolutely not. Do you know Jesus, man? I'm not kidding. See, it sounds funny. On the scene, it wasn't funny. You would have been like, God, you're going to jail. Go ahead. Put me in jail. You can't take this from me. The prison guards will get saved. I'm not kidding. See, I, I, I'm sold out. It doesn't matter. You can't shut this down. Until I die, I will preach the truth. I will speak the truth in love. Just like I've been all weekend here. I do it every day of my life. Every encounter is an encounter with the truth. I don't have anything else to talk about except my Jesus. Nothing. Ever. In any situation. I mean, we I, small talk, but it's coming to Jesus. Because he's the only thing that matters. He's the name above every name. He's the name that trumps every every situation that you're in and no matter what he is on hand he wants you to know that he is lord he wants you to know that he is the king of kings and you are a king that he's a king of you are a royal priesthood a holy generation set apart for good works you have a crown of righteousness laid up for you one day when you stand before him but you can live in righteousness right now through the free gift that he's given you and the abundance of grace that helps you unwrap that thing and empowers you to walk out that thing. And that is who you've been called to be. You've been called to be sons and daughters. And the cop's looking at me. I said, man, I said, I, I can't leave him. I will not leave him. Listen, man, do you know Jesus? What? He's cussing. Don't you blank and move him. I said, I'm not going to move him. I know the rules, man. Here's my rule. Love the Lord thy God with all my heart, my strength, my soul, and my mind. And love my neighbor as myself. And that cop's my neighbor. He just doesn't know it yet. I said, I will not move him, but I will not leave him. He goes, well, just don't move him. The paramedics are on the way. I said, all right. Bless you. Guys, looking at me off the ground. Who are you, man? So I'm a Christian that's sold out, man. Just like you're going to be. Why? Because this infects the world around you. Because I am into it to endure the suffering for doing good for the sake of God's elect that's on the ground in front of me right now. God's elect that's persecuting me right there, that cop that needs to know my Jesus. But maybe he's never met a sold out Christian. Maybe if he does, he would have hope inside of him for the guy in the back seat in which I used to be for 22 years of my life. But how could he know, lest he see? You are to live as an example. You are to be an example in a lost and dying world of what it means to be a son that's on fire. Really true. Get possessed with this. Let it provoke you. I'm hoping to just, boom, thump your heart where you're, <sighs> where a situation you can't hold back anymore. Because the fear of holding God back 
is outweighed by the fear. See, there's a place to where the fear of, of, of being afraid of people is dominating. You can't do it anymore. You're inside, you're like, ah, and you explode, man. You just let him out. It's awesome. Like a lion and that's it. And you find out that all that other stuff was lies. Sorry if you're in the spray zone today. So. Paramedics come, and when the EMTs come, it's time for me to back away, because that's grace. I know, because I've been in lots of situations like that. When they come, they're the professionals. I just, I just, I say, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. I'm just going to pray. I walk away so that they can get their hands in, because they have to secure the neck. They have to do everything. I was making sure that that was steady when I was there. Prayed for him. I did not see his ankle flip around. Prayed for him the whole time that his body would be healed of any internal injuries, anything that's happening in his body, that he would be made whole. I believe that. I, I'm, I'm totally on page. I wish I could tell you that his leg flipped around, but it didn't. It would have been amazing, but I wish that it would have flipped around, but it didn't. So thankful to be a Christian. I'm so thankful to be on fire. I'm so thankful to just be in love with Jesus. He is so powerful. He is so lovely. He is so worthy. He's worthy. Worthy is the lamb that is slain. Worthy. He's everything. If you would just see the opportunity that you have every day, You would stop letting sin ensnare you and enslave you because you'd realize that you're no longer a slave of sin but you're a slave unto righteousness you're a slave unto this king that saw all your trash and all your junk and said I want that one the one that was hanging on a tree because you were the joy set before him because he knew that by him enduring that suffering and all that junk that he went through Men are a king that never sinned before. Saw you, saw you. Said, I want that one. I'll do this just for the one. Just for the one. So I backed away. And the cop's talking to this guy. I shared this the other night. The cop's talking to this guy. And I said, hey. He was what? I said, man, I don't think you heard me, man, when I was talking to you. I asked you if you knew Jesus. You didn't tell me. Said, what, what does that have to do with anything? I said, everything, man. And I shared my testimony with him. And I said, I was the guy sitting in the back of your car, man. Not one cop my whole life, and every time I got arrested, and every time I got in trouble, not one cop told me about Jesus. Not one. Not one. And what a position of authority that you have. The people are in the back of your car and they can't do anything but listen. <laughs> See, now I know police officers. I know FBI agents that are on fire for Jesus, man. Possessed by God. The other day I was, I was flying back from, Euro from Europe and I'm on the, the train. My wife and I are on the train just from uh, in Washington, Dulles. And I saw a guy with a shirt on that said, um, serve your country. And I'm like, man, thank you for serving, man. Bless you. He said, oh, thanks, man. Turns around. My wife and I are just getting ready to go to baggage claim, get our stuff. Turns around, he goes, sir, I didn't know who you were. Thanks for what you do. And he hands me his thing. He's a CIA agent. I thought, whoa. CIA knows who I am. I'm not kidding. Just see when I got an email from the FBI. I mean, I'm clean, so I don't have anything to worry about. But it's weird. But it's amazing. So listen to the testimonies of what's happening inside the federal building. Of Jesus encounters, overwhelming encounters where people are getting wrecked by the gospel. And he knows people that are in the CIA that are getting wrecked with the gospel. All it takes is one. 
All it takes is one. What did Jesus do with 12? <laughs> if you would see who you are, hell would tremble when you walk instead of us being afraid. All it takes is selling out. Sell out everything you are so you can finally become who Jesus says you are. Son of your papa. I tell the cop, I said, man, I was in the back of so many cop cars, man. Nobody ever told me about Jesus, man. I said, and I got rescued. I got shot at, man. Three meters away. Boom, 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 boom. And Jesus spoke to me. Told me he loved me. Told me that, he, am I ready to live for him yet? And what kind of opportunity? Did you ever get shot at with a nine millimeter, I'm saying? To him? No. Well, if you shot at somebody from 10 feet away, would you hit him? What if you were a bad shot? I'd hit him. Exactly. I wasn't. A full clip, dude. That's why I'm crazy. Because I'm crazy in love with the one that spared my life when I should have died. Now I'm alive. And I'm alive and in front of you telling you about Jesus, man. You've met a sold out Christian that's not afraid. I love you, man. But if you knew this, you could tell people in the back seat. See, I was that guy. Now I know Jesus. I travel and I preach the gospel and you can't stop it. And he's like... I had no idea. Thank you, sir. He walks away. I don't care what he looks at. He goes, whatever. He can do whatever he wants. It's the truth. You can't stop it. It's real. The business guy, he looks at me. He says, sir. I said, yeah. He says, you, you have no idea what's happening. Here. What, what, what has happened? I go, what do you mean? He goes, no, no, no. Listen to me. I'm a Christian. I had nothing to give him. I've never seen anything like this. You changed my life today. You'll never know. I just want to thank you. That's it. He walked away with tears in his eyes, got in his car. I get in my car. Because I'm not looking or needing that, but I know that that scripture is in here. That I endure the suffering for the sake of God's elect. Because everybody that you see, God loves. And you could be the reason for them making the choice. They might have never seen a life that's sold out. They might have never seen somebody that's completely abandoned to the heart of the Father. And you might be the only one that they get to see. You might be the one that shatters seed right there. Because that was seed. And that cop, boom, 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 he's getting slaughtered with seed. Because I'm a Christian terrorist. I terrorize the devil's camp, dude. Everywhere I go, it doesn't matter where I go. I terrorize his camp every second of every day. Every, every time I'm awake, I terrorize him. Why? Because that's what we do. For this reason, Son of Man was made manifest to destroy the works of the devil. That's my mission. That's my call. Destroy the works of the devil. My job is to scatter as much seed. See, the pressure's off. You don't have to talk somebody into Jesus. That doesn't, that doesn't work anyway. Nobody gets manipulated into Jesus. No one comes unless the Father draws them. But you can represent the Son in such a way that they get rocked by your very life, by you walking, talking, breathing Jesus. Nothing can stop them from getting the seeds that you have to give except you from throwing them out there. You're the only one that can shut this down. And every believer is responsible. Every believer is responsible to walk out their value in front of people. You guys okay? Yeah. One more testimony? Yeah. All right. Endure the suffering for the sake of God's elect. Read it again. Ready? Therefore, verse 10, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Jesus Christ. Eternal glory. 
But this is faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful because he can't deny himself. <laughs> Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of people that hear it. But be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And their message will spread like cancer. Amenius and Philetus are two of, that so are of this sort who strayed concerning the truth, saying the resurrection's already passed. They overflow the faith of some. Nevertheless, see, no matter what anybody preaches, that false grace twisted demonic doctrine that says all that junk that we've been nailing so good to the tree. Because <laughs> it's all lies. There ain't no way for you to walk out of this meeting because that guy's a false grace guy. Man, the Holy Ghost to shake you. <laughs> Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God still stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are His, and let everybody who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. E. Oh. Gosh, I've got to read a little more. But in a great house there are also, or there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleans himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified for the useful of the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also youthful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, and love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant dis disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord may not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. If God, perhaps, would grant them repentance, so that they may know the truth, and that they may come to their senses, escaping and escape the snare of the devil, having been made captive by him to do his will. In humility, correct those in opposition. If God perhaps would grant them repentance so they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil having been, been taken captive to do his will. I think we read half the Bible today. No. no hold on. Now. Gosh, I have a couple testimonies I'm going to share. I'm just going to roll a little bit and share the end result of a life lived in his righteousness, of a life lived that's unintimidated, that's not intimidated, that's not rattled, that's not rocked by people's opinions around you. I delivered, I delivered ice on one of my jobs. There's, so, there's thousands and thousands of testimonies, but I, but I want to share, huh? Literal ice. Yeah, not like meth. Like I, <laughs> yeah, back when I delivered ice, an ice truck, like when you go and buy a bag of ice, this is when Jesus was in my life, and I got a job as an ice delivery guy. When I worked, when I went to work at the plant, the uncle that owned, uh, his brother owns the company with him, his nephew, they go to a church that does not believe in miracles. It's a cessationist church. They are totally against it. And I go to work there, and, I, and he gives me the job, and his uncle has told him about me. And his nephew is very curious about this. He's been taught his whole life. He's grown up there. He's probably 27 years old. Went to church since he was a baby at this church. And they teach adamantly against it. So I get there and I tell him, I said, man, I said, and he shows me what to do. And I'm like, man, I'm so excited. Thank you so much for the opportunity. 
And I'm supposed to deliver, I'm supposed to work on the docks that day and put ice in the back of vehicles and stuff when they come up. So I get the order, talk to the person, get the order, go and get the bags of ice, put it in their car, take the money, go to the cash box, write the receipt, give it back, simple. Eight pound bags, 20 pound bags, 40 pound bags, easy, easy job. So the first person comes up and I'm like, hey, how can I help you today? He's like, oh, I'd like to get a couple of 20 pound bags. Oh, that's awesome. Hey, do you have a problem with your right shoulder? <laughs> yes, I do. I said, man, I said, I'm going to go get your ice. I'm going to pray for you and Jesus is going to heal you. Are you cool with that? What? <laughs> so I go and get the ice, put it in the back of his truck, get the money, go and get the receipt, bring it back out to the car, hand him his receipt. Let me pray for your shoulder, please. All right. Pray for shoulder. What the blank is going on? So check it out, man. What's it feel like? Is you a Christian? Yeah. <laughs> Ask if he believed that Jesus died for him. Ask if I believe that he rose from the dead for him. Ask if he's ever asked him to come and live in his life. Yeah. His language doesn't show that. But God judges the heart. All I can do is ask. I'm not supposed to headlock him in. I'm not supposed to be mad at him because he's talking a certain way. Remember we talked about Lot? That's not me. The shepherd and overseer of my soul keeps my soul pure and focused on him and people swearing around me regardless of their life. Doesn't make me come against them. That makes me walk out righteousness which will infect them. I will not be affected by words that people speak about me. I will not be affected by people's words that speak about others. I will completely infect the situation because I believe that God's grace is bigger. Grace is a teacher. We talked about it earlier. Lots of that, right? So the guy gets in his car. He takes off. I walk by. And Jared's hiding behind the door listening. Next person comes up. That first day, seven people on the docks are healed, made whole. And I did my job. as under the Lord and not for people. It's awesome. And I said, all right, man, I'll see you tomorrow morning. He goes, yeah, right. Second day, boom, same thing. Can't help it. Miracles overtake me. I'm a son. It's just the way it is. I'm going to pray for everyone, everywhere I go. Why? Because I can. It's awesome. Second day happens again. Third day, Jared, this guy that's been taught his whole life. Remember I talked about strongholds? All this has to do with everything I've preached. Strongholds that are established in the church that that the word of God has become, religious doctrine has become a stronghold right here. But now he's seen the reality of God flowing and living in a life that knows that he's right with God. Someone comes up and I have a word of knowledge. Jared comes up and he goes, can I pray for him? I go, do it. He prays for him and God gets healed. The next day, Jared's praying for people. What happens? I have now infected their reality because of Christ in me, the hope of glory. Really. Two weeks later, Jared's like, hey, I'm going to put you on a route with somebody today. He hates God. Man. I said, great, dude, put me there. I'm not, it doesn't matter if you hate God. I love God. Your hate to God, your hatred of God is the only, the only reason you hate God is because you don't know him. And you've heard people talk about him and he's been blamed for lots of things that he's never done. You've blamed God for things that he's never done. He doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. He came to give. And if you'd see that love so that love gave, you'd be rocked by that. You wouldn't be like, I hate God that gives and loves. <laughs> I hate a God that gives and loves. No, you hate God because you think that he stole, took. He doesn't come to steal, kill, and destroy. Wrong God, little G. That's the God of this world. He comes to destroy. So he puts me in this truck with a guy named Sonny. Now, Sonny is like a 51-year-old guy. He knows his job. He's been there for like, I think, nine years. He's, he's like, I mean, he's a senior there. You know, he's one of the guys, the head guys. All I am is his helper. Jared's told me what I need to do, how I need to load the bags, what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to help him get the ice off the back of the truck, onto the cart, get it into the store, put it into the ice box, and then he's going to take care of the bill and stuff. And I'm supposed to make his life easier because I'm a helper. That's what the Holy Spirit is to me. He's a helper. He makes my life easier. That's what he does. That's just how I think, man. So I go and we get to the first place. And boom, boom, boom. I'm working, man. Just love it. I'm doing my job is under the Lord. I'm like having an exciting time. Load the box inside. Hit the ice off the truck. 
He doesn't have to do anything. He's in the truck. By the time he gets out of the truck, I've got everything loaded, ready to go. I take it in there, get everything put away. Boom. Now, he just looks at me with disgust. He's mad because he can't believe that I'm like working like this. Like he's mad at me. Attitude. It didn't help that when we first got in the truck at the ice plant, I said to him, I said, hey man, it's so nice to meet you. Yeah? You ever done this before? No. Because you had a new guy. He said, how long do you think you'll last? I said, I don't know. I'm just going to work hard every day, enjoy every day. What do you mean? Yeah, Jesus loves me. Come on. And I told him when I got in the truck, by the way, today, bunches of people are going to get healed, man. What are you talking about? Jesus is going to touch people and heal people. Shut up, man. Turns music up. That was our beginning. That's how we started our own. I do the same thing on planes. I tell people when I sit down. I don't wait. I tell them. I want to make sure we start our ride out right. <laughs> I've got the truth. I don't got a truth. I don't got some kind of truth. I don't got something about the truth. I've got a truth. The truth. The one. The one and only. The way. The truth. The life. It's awesome. So he's turned the music up real loud. I got my old, like the old CD players you carry with you, the big ones and the headphones and stuff, you know? I mean, it's only like 10 years ago, but still. So we get to the first place. He goes in after I'd done this, you know, and uh, I go out and there's a road worker that walks by and I said to her, I said, hey. I said, honey, I said, do you have a problem with your back? You're holding that sign out there. Yeah, I got a problem with my back. What the blank said to you? Tough. I said, oh, nothing. I said, I just, sciatic stuff, go down your leg. She goes, yeah. I said, can I just pray for you, please? She goes, why? I said, because I believe Jesus will heal you. Yeah, that'd be blank and nice. <laughs> you think God's not going to move. She's cussing. Silly. <laughs> Isn't going to torment this. I'm focused, man. Jesus. His love is bigger than all that stuff. So I prayed for her. I said, bend and check your back. She goes, and her leg, the numbness in her leg went away. She goes, what the blank did you do? I said, I just prayed for you. Jesus loves you. Did you ever go to church before? Yeah, when I was little, I went to church. I had to. Since you got hurt, you know, by religion. Yeah, my parents made me. I said, man, I said, this isn't religion. I said, this is the love of God for you. He loves you. So what do you think of that? She goes, I think this is blank and awesome. <laughs> I'm like, this cool. Sunny comes out. He goes around the truck, doesn't even look at me, kind of like attitude, gets in the truck. I said, would you do me a favor? She goes, sure. I said, you tell my friend, his name's Sonny, he's a good friend, sitting in the truck. Over there. Could you go tell him what Jesus just did for you? She goes, I sure will. She's not afraid, dude. I get in the truck and I'm like, I want to get in the truck so I can hear it. So I get in the truck, I sit in the seat. Sonny's writing some paper stuff out. She comes up. Knocks on the window. She goes, hey. What? He's just got attitude, man. He's mad at the world. He's been hurt and crushed by life. Like a lot of people do. Your war's not against them. If they see how good God is, they won't be that way anymore. And you can walk in the light as he is in the light. And you can walk in the midst of a perverse, corrupt generation and shine as a light and shake people's foundation. So she says, that guy is in your truck? Yeah. What do you do? Like, he knew about my blank and back, came up and told me, Jesus told him. Then he prays for my back and all the pain left my leg. It's completely healed. He's like, first day. I'm just sitting there. He won't even look at it. He's mad, dude. We got to ride around the truck all day long. It happened, if I remember correctly, it happened seven times that day. I just kept yelling, telling him to come knock on the window and tell him. <laughs> See, it's a problem. See, because even when people weren't there, they would give me their routes once I got my CDL, and I would go on their route, and I'd deliver ice on their whole route. I'd go to beer distributors. I'd go everywhere, and I'd pray for people, everywhere. People would get healed. So when they came back on the job, they'd be like, Hey, where's that guy who was here the other day? This is their normal route they've been doing for years. I would mess it up. <laughs> hey, can you pray for me? Because when he prayed for my friend, his shoulder was healed. How about you pray for me? Get away from me. I prayed for you. 
So now everybody's got an attitude with me. Everybody's got an attitude with me. What's it mean to shine on your job? Could you handle it? Could you handle if people were mad at you on your job? If people were angry at you on your job because you represented Jesus? Because that is what is going to happen. Because all of those that desire to live godly, they will and are going to suffer persecution. But that persecution isn't for preaching at people. That persecution is actually for living godly. Because when you're reviled and persecuted, you do not revile in return. Because we're following in the steps, the footsteps of our king. Who committed no sin. Stop saying that, man. Stop saying that. No, it's in the Bible. Those are the steps you're supposed to follow. To not commit sin. Willful sin. Man, that stuff comes into you. You don't even want to do that anymore. It's tasteless. It's, it's yuck. Why would you want that? Grace is a teacher denying that stuff. Grace helps you, teaches you. Deny it. Run after him. Deny it. Run after Jesus. Deny it. And if you trip, if you trip, not when you sin, if you sin, you have an advocate, a lawyer, who's faithful and just to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. That's our Jesus. That's our King. And you can live godly in this age, man. Don't let somebody water this down and and bring some kind of blinders and put them on your eyes because Satan blinds the eyes of those lest they should see. Now that we see such great a salvation as this, how shall we be entangled again in yuck? No way, dude. So that was our first day together, me and Sonny. Paul, oh, he's just not happy at all. He doesn't even want to talk to me. You know what I do? We get back to the thing. I know what I got to do. I got to go back into his truck and I got to open up the back door and I got to go back in there and get all the skids and all the plastic wrapping paper and all that stuff. I have to gather it together. I have to get a dolly. I have to get that thing out of there. I have to put them away. I have to get all the plastic and put it away. And then I get a broom and I have to sweep the back of the truck and get everything, get all of it done. We're both supposed to do it, but I don't need him to help me. I can do this. It's easy. Why? Because I'm not working for him. I'm doing my job, Colossians 3.17, as unto the Lord and not for people. I am not doing it for him. But I am going to do it as unto the Lord in front of him so that he sees the reality of my light so shy. Come on, man. This Christianity 101. Or Christianity 123. Whatever. Either way, it's who we're supposed to be. So... I asked Jared, I said, can I go with him again? He said, he's requested that you not go with him again. <laughs> when I got done sweeping the truck that day, and I worked, I worked hard all day long, he did not say thank you. He walked by me and went, that's it. Hey, man, I'll see you tomorrow. Whatever. Again, another guy, ride with him. Same thing, boom. This time we go into a Muslim mart. Huh. How much fun is this going to be? I'm not intimidated. Muslims, he ain't going to say anything in here. Oh, you're wrong. Oh, I'm just going to talk about my Jesus every day, all day long. All day, every day. All day, every day. You cannot shut it down. I am possessed by the love of Jesus. He loves me. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Some of you need to smile because he loves you. Are you happy about Jesus? Send a message. Send a message to your face. So again and again and again and again, and in Harrisburg, I have a name. The Iceman Cometh. I promise. I'm serious. I would deliver. They'd give me the little truck to deliver to all the Muslim and the Sikh stores, all of them. And I'd see Muslims healed and Sikhs healed and people come to Jesus every day. And in my ice job, I would see between 10 and 30 people healed or touched every day of my life. Every day. Every day. All day, every day. 
and never shut down. Why? Because I am the one responsible to shut this thing down. Jesus said, let your light so shine. It says, no one, having lit a lamp, puts a bushel on it. No one puts it under a bed. No one puts it there. He puts it on a lampstand for the whole house to be lit up, for the whole city to be lit up. That's who you are. Not this little light. It's an amazing, brilliant, boom light. You guys all right? So I went through that. Then I got my, I ended up, I ended up getting my real estate license. (laughs) Imagine me as a realtor, dude. (laughs) So good. I did. I got my real estate license. I was going to go start real estate. So my first two-week notice I ever put in on my job. Never put a two-week notice in in my whole life. 34 years, dude. I just didn't care. Now I two-week notice. I'm like, man, two weeks. We don't want you to go. I got to go. You know, the people that were... The people that were back at the plant that went to that church, that cessationist church, all the while, for the whole year and a half that I was there, I would get, when someone would get healed, if a deaf ear would open up, or someone's leg would get healed, or something, I would call back to base on walkie-talkie. Hey, this is Todd. Is anybody there? Yes, Todd. This is Beth. Can I help you? Yep. I have someone here that wants to talk to you. (laughs) Why? Because it doesn't matter if you're cessationist. Doesn't matter if you don't believe that miracles are real. Doesn't matter if you don't think that Jesus does this stuff. These are people testifying. These are other people testifying of what Jesus just did. The Lord just healed my shoulder. It's frozen for years. And your person, thank you so much for your company. Thank you that you represent Jesus like this. Oh well, bless you. But I was in irritation. Because I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna. I wasn't going to change the way that I believe for anybody. But I need to do my job as under the Lord and not for people. I need to make sure that I'm doing my job as under the Lord so that I can be so heavenly minded that I'm earthly incredible. And they want more people like me. They're just freaked out with the supernatural part. Freaked out about living godly. Freaked out. So two week notice get put in. Last day of the job. Jared said to me. He goes, hey Todd. He goes, Sonny wants you to go with him today. Now, Sonny hasn't even talked to me, man. Like, I'm talking like, talking about a year and a half of persecution. Year and a half. (laughs) And Sonny's like, yeah, I want him to go with me. I want to talk to him today. Think about that. Hated me. I just, I just, I just love them. Bless those that hate you. You don't hate people back. Well, they hate me, I hate them back. That's crazy. So the last day we get in the truck, we go to a stop. He doesn't really say much. He goes, man, he goes, I'm really, really bummer that you're leaving. I said, man, I said, I'm going to be a real estate agent. <laughs> I got my license, dude. I'm like a felon and stuff. They gave me my license. <laughs> No, I had to go in front of the real estate enforcement committee and all that and appeal everything. I had to go up there and preach the gospel at the state building. Sent me to a psychologist. Everything, dude. I mean, you have no idea. It was like a big deal. It was. They said, I need to go to see a shrink because they thought I was crazy. Because then they said, tell us about your record. And I said, oh, I was a drug addict. Oh, yeah, and I told my testimony. Well, how long have you been clean? Oh, I just got clean. It's... Jesus cleaned me the whole way on the inside. See, it's all about Jesus, what he wants to do in a man. And what he's done in me is he's changed my life. He's made old things pass away and all things become new. Okay, sir, it's enough about Jesus. No, 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 you don't understand. It can never be enough about Jesus. They sent me to a psychologist. And at the psychologist, he asked me if I hear voices. And I said, absolutely. I did. Jesus, I, I said, are you a Christian? He said, yes, I am. I said, do you believe that Jesus said my sheep will hear and obey my voice? I said, if Jesus said you could hear it. He goes, well, that's kind of symbolic. He said, no, you're wrong, man. I shared my testimony. He goes, wow. The reason why he said, do I hear voices is because I got a word of knowledge about his lady out front, prayed for her, and Jesus healed her. Then I had another word of knowledge about him. Do you hear voices? Absolutely. So I put in the clean bill of health, and they gave me my license. So now, 
I'm like, last day, riding with Sonny. We get to the beer distributor. We walk in, because we have to deliver ice to the beer places, because they need a lots of ice. I pray for so many people carrying their kegs and cases across parking lots, man. Oh, woo! Be in there, people picking out their beer. Hey, man, Jesus loves you so much, man. You know that? Put nice away. He loves you guys so much. I used to be an alcoholic for 22 years, man. <laughs> I'm serious, I did. I was. This stuff ruled my life, man. Oh, we're just gonna have, you know, the game and stuff. Oh, that's cool, man. I can help you carry your stuff out to the car. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus. God bless this guy. Oh, really ridiculous, awesome. See, if you live this way, you'll never need a pulpit to validate you. You'll just love Jesus and you'll do your job as under the Lord. And all of a sudden, you'll be, you'll be happy doing your job because you'll be doing it for the man. How exciting is that? You wouldn't need a pulpit to prove you who you are. You just need to know Jesus because he approves of who you are. And you know his will, crush hell for a living. Be a Christian, come on. So we're in there, we walk by, we walk in and I watch this lady, she's walking like this. She's one of the owners, this mom and pop, case of keg place. I said to her, and Sonny walks around the corner, she's getting the, checking to see how much ice they need. And I said, hey, hon, I said, what happened to you? She goes, oh, I don't got no hip. I go, no way. I said, can I pray for you? She goes, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. Sonny pops his head around the corner and he goes, let him pray for you. <laughs> See, what you don't understand is the seeds that you're sowing with your life are highly effective. And they reproduce after their own kind. So without him saying anything and him per persecuting me and reviling me the whole time, for the whole time I'm there, it was hitting his heart. Boom. People mock and scoff what they don't know. But it becomes overwhelming to people where they can't get away from it anymore. <gasps> Serious. Be on a plane with somebody and sit down. Start sharing your heart. I don't believe in that. Boom, 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 boom. And before you know it, they're like, because they can't get away. It's done. It's over. Then you get words of knowledge, prophesy, share stuff about their kids, what you do, what he did for a living, where your wife is, what happened with that, and this, that, and the other thing. Oh my God, what's going on right now? I said, love. I'm serious. So intense. And you're locked in a steel tube and can't go anywhere. So good. Let's be consumed with the love of Jesus. All I've been preaching to you for five sessions. Five. All about the love of Jesus. And then you go and sing the blood of Jesus tonight, which wrecks me, man. Then you give me the microphone right after the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Sonny says, let him pray for you. She goes, I don't believe. No, 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 mom. Let him pray for you. See, he's known her for years and years and years and years and watched her be in pain for years and years and years and years. And it wasn't an issue because he didn't know that anything was available. But now he's seen it available and heard of it available because I took his route when he didn't come to work several times when he had this or that to do. He took days off. They'd give me his truck. I'd be pleased to go. He would get so many people talking to him about Jesus when he came back to the job. He got extra mad, madder and madder and more madder and more madder and more madder. But he didn't change the facts. The facts were that Jesus was real and was touching people. And people that weren't Christians became Christians. What are you going to do? How are you going to escape it? You can't escape it. We're supposed to cover the earth, man. The glory of the Lord is supposed to cover the earth. And you're supposed to be a releaser of that very glory. It's all the word, dude. No way out. Ah, what do I do? Just give up. Okay, I'm in. That's it. That's good. All right. Now go be. All right. Go be. There's a scripture in 2 Corinthians, chapter 2, verse 14. It says this. God always leads me in a victory parade in Christ. He always leads me in victory. And through me, He diffuses the fragrance of the knowledge of Him. That means that everywhere I go, I'm a Christian air freshener. I am. When stuff gets hard, I just release it. But you can't release it if you don't know him. 
And you can't know him unless you're right with him. And when you're right with God, you release the knowledge of God. And the fragrance of Christ is in you. And everywhere you go, you smell like Jesus. Promise. It's really good. So I pray for this lady. And Sonny's there. He kind of walks around the corner. He, he got ahead of himself. Because he didn't realize what he just said. Let him pray for you. Let him pray for you. He walks behind the wall. And I prayed for her. And her hip got restored. She stood up. And she limped at first. And then it started to get better. She goes, oh my God. Sonny goes, what happened? Because he got ahead of himself. Because his heart took him places before his brain could get there. Because that's the way the word is. And that's the way your life is. Is your heart can take you places that your brain can't fit. And all of a sudden you overwhelm people from inside. And they start to think from their heart instead of their mind. And the surroundings start to change because of the Christ that's in you. So I talked to them about Jesus and shared the gospel. They didn't pray with me and ask to receive Jesus. I just believe that that seed is so powerful that every day she's going to wake up with a brand new hip. It's going to overwhelm her. We got in the truck. We get to the truck and Sonny kind of gets it totally different than our first day. <laughs> he gets in and gets the paper and stuff and he sits down. And he goes, I'm really going to miss you, man. And I go, man, I, I love you, buddy. He goes, I know, man. That's what's wrong, man. <laughs> Just, that's what you do. You just love people. Why, man? Why? I said, because I used to be hurt by life, but I'm not hurt by life anymore. He goes, listen. He goes, I, I want you to do me a favor. He goes, I got arthritis in my thumbs. Will you, you pray for my thumbs, man? I go, dude, give me your thumbs, man. <laughs> Kidding me? Come on. Jesus. He knocks out the arthritis out of his thumbs. He goes, I knew it, man. I knew it. I didn't say, why didn't you ask me sooner? I said, but God loves you so much. As you know, let's talk today. I got to share the gospel for eight hours with him that day. Eight hours. Eight hours of gospel. Jesus loves you, man. Say goodbye to him. It's so nice to work with you. I'm going to miss you, man. I love you too. Gives me a big hug. You'll never forget what Jesus did for you. He goes, I can't, man. <laughs> what kind of effect are you having on your surroundings? What kind of effect? <laughs> How about your family? What kind of an effect are you having on your family? What about your family that hates you? What about your family that doesn't want to talk to you? What about your family that doesn't want to hear you talk about your Jesus? What about your family that persecutes you and says mean things about you? What about that? How are you doing with them? People are like, well, you know, a prophet's without honor in his hometown. Stop using that excuse to not share Jesus. So they reject you, but you haven't been rejected. You've been accepted in the beloved. Can I tell you a really personal testimony? Are you guys okay? Are we good on time? Are we, are we all right? Well, it's my last session, man. Come on. This is one that you were with me for. Remember? We were at my house. Keith came up. My buddy Keith. Mitchell, love his heart, man, pouring out truth, walking it out, man. <laughs> she asked me what the greatest miracle I ever saw was. It's a Christian that's sold out, that loves Jesus, that's transformed, that their own family doesn't recognize him anymore. That's the greatest miracle. So when I came out of Teen Challenge, I was zealous for Jesus, on fire for the Lord, 
burning for Jesus, burning. Nobody could put it out, nobody. Not all my relatives were on page, like none, none, none. I would tell them about Jesus and they'd hammer me. One by one, they'd say yes to Jesus. Now they're not all like on fire burning and walking out Christ, but at least they believe right now that Jesus is real. And they didn't believe because they watched me preach. They started to one by one believe because they watched my life. Because it wasn't rattled by their stuff. <laughs> but there's this one. One of my relatives, very, very, very angry, bitter, mad, very mad. And he would persecute me and tell me about my Jesus. Oh, you're going to bring your Jesus into this? Oh, what about Jesus? And he would just hammer me. I mean, not a little bit. I'm talking the worst. Boom, boom, boom. Hammer. Scream in my face. I don't give a blank about your Man, but he loves you, man. And I'd still tell him about Jesus. You can punch me in the face. You're not taking my king. I believe that when your hand connects with my face, the presence that's in me will get you. I'm not kidding. I really believe that. He's really that good to me. So Keith's up at my house. We're up there, my daughter's birthday. It was her 16th birthday, it was two years ago. 16th birthday, and we're celebrating at my house like at 11 or something at night. I get this phone call, then another phone call, then another phone call. I'm like, what is that? Crazy. Keep calling, keep calling. I'm not answering because I don't know who it is. You have no idea. Like the calls that come from... <laughs> I can't. I just can't do it. It's too much. I can't answer everything. So then he leaves a message. So it's my angry relative. Now my grandma had just passed away. She had died a couple months prior. And they were kind of caretakers for her because they lived beside her. And it was a lot on them. And so when she died, I spoke, at the, I spoke at her funeral just for like 10 minutes and just thanked my grandma because she was uh, Episcopalian. So she prayed for me not to go to hell. And she didn't practice religion. She didn't practice Jesus, but that was the only thing she knew to pray. She prayed for me my whole life. It is awesome. She wasn't on fire Christian, born again, none of that stuff. Until right before she died. But still. So... At the funeral, I gave, kind of, I spoke, and man, this, my relative hated the fact that I would talk about Jesus ever. So he leaves this message on my phone. He says, I'm about done with this Jesus blankety, blank, blank, blank. I'll tell you what, Mr. Hotshot. You talk about this Jesus all the time. We'll see how much you believe in him, because I'm going to come and put a bullet in your head. So what happened was my relative used to be an alcoholic. So now he started drinking again, and he's taking medication and drinking at the same time, which is causing this thing to go off really bad. So he leaves that on my phone, and I'm like, oh my gosh, dude. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus, because give him peace. So then he leaves another one on my phone. This time it's way worse. Leaves the same message, he says, you call me back in two minutes or I'm out of here and I'm on my way to your house. Hot shot, Mr. Preacher Man. And then he thinks he hung the phone up, but he didn't hang the phone up. And I hear my other relative, his wife, screaming on the phone. You're not going anywhere. What do you think you're doing? I'm going to put a bullet in his head. I had a gun on my hip in church when grandma died, when mom died. If my father wouldn't have stopped my hand, I'd have shot him right there. Because he'd already started binging. Now he's totally angry. He's my relative. People that are close to you. So then the phone runs out the answering machine. I'm like, wow, I got to tell Jackie. Like, he's going to come to my house. So I talked to my wife and I said, hey, this is like, this is going on right now. She goes, well, what are you going to do? You... I said, well, if he comes here, I said, I don't have any guns. I said, I wouldn't fight with him. I wouldn't let him come in the house. I said, I'll go out in the yard. I said, I'm not going to fight him. I love Jesus, loves him. 
Like, you know, I know in my heart that one day I'll lose my life for the gospel. But I didn't want it to be in my house in front of my kids with my own relative. And I'm crying. I was like, you need to call the police. So I called the police and I said, I don't know what to do. I need somebody to come over. And so the cop comes over, he gets in my driveway, and I said, hey, man. I said, first thing I want to talk to you about is, are you a Christian? I need to know. Because I need to know if you're going to be able to handle what I have to tell you. And if you're a Christian, at least you have some grid for it. So he shared, yeah, actually I am. I said, good, man, that's awesome. Then we can talk as brothers. So I shared the truth about my life, my testimony, all that stuff. And I shared about my uncle and how lost he is and how much I did wrong to my family before Christ. And he holds that against me. And it's even worse now because now I've been a Jesus freak for, for eight and a half years. I said, and he is so mad, man. I said, and so this voice is coming on the other end of a phone. Somebody that's drinking, somebody that's, that's using, you know, he's using painkillers and all this stuff and drinking. I said, and his mind is confused and I do not want to get him in trouble, but I need to keep him safe because what if he hurts my aunt? What if he comes over here and causes trouble and does something that he can't get out of? He's like, no, I understand exactly what you're saying. He said, sir, my suggestion is that you, that you give me your phone. He said, give me your phone so we can examine the message. He goes, we'll have the state police go over and arrest him. And they'll put him in a drunk tank tonight. So they'll get him sober, get him in a drunk tank. I'm like, that sound to me sounds like a best option. So I'm like, that's awesome, please. That'll be good. He's all right, that's what we're going to do. So they called state police. State police actually go over there and apprehend him, take all his guns. He's like a sharp, he's like a... a a gun guy, man, like sharpshooter. But he's got all these guns and stuff. The police confiscate his guns and all that that night. Take it away. He goes to jail that night to drunk tank. They release him in the morning and they call my phone and tell me, or they call my house and they tell me that they released your uncle this morning just so you know he's on the loose. I'm not thinking threat. I'm thinking his buzz wore off. We're okay. You know what I mean? But we were actually. He didn't come over to the house. They put a, 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 a whatever restraint thing on him, right? So that he couldn't come near the house and all that. And I had to go out of town anyway, so he couldn't be there. So I went out of town and, and went and preached the gospel, shared the truth, just like this, same thing. Come back. Two weeks later, I get a subpoena in the mail. And the subpoena is my uncle because the commonwealth of, of the state that I live in is now pressing charges on him. So now one of them's terroristic threats. One of them's like threatened to, with intent to kill. All kinds of stuff, dude. These are, we're talking like major felony stuff. Like, he's going to get nailed. And he works in an elementary school. He's like a maintenance guy. And it's right at the same time that the Boston shootings happened in America. So it's not good. So they're like going to, they're going to crucify my uncle, man. And I'm like, you're kidding me. Like, no way. This is crazy. Well, I'm just going to go there and drop the charges. So we have to reschedule the court hearing. I go there that day and I show up. And when I show up, this, this cop comes out, same one that was in my driveway, the one that we talked to, my brother, in Christ. And I said to him, I said, hey, man, I said, what's going on right now? He goes, yeah. He goes, well, you know, state decided to pick up charges. He goes, and they're going to charge your uncle. You have to testify against him. I go, that ain't happening, dude. You're kidding, right? I said, I thought you said you were a Christian, man. So what does that mean to you? He said, well, it's out of my control. I said, so it was the authorities that God gave you. I said, come on, man. What you're saying is that what we talked about in the driveway isn't happening right now. And you really think i got to testify? My uncle was drunk. He didn't know any better, man. He needs mercy. You heard my testimony, right? He needs mercy. They're like, well, that's not the way it's going to work, and I don't really know what to say to you. And he was just ashamed. I said, I'm not mad at you, dude. I said, this is just twisted. So the defense attorney, or the assistant DA comes out. Comes out, she goes, did you tell him what's going on? He said, I tried to, but he won't listen. I said, oh, I'm listening. I listened to everything you had to say, man. I'm just not pressing charges. She goes, oh, you, she goes, you don't have to. The state's pressing charges. All you have to do is give your testimony <laughs> about, what, about what had happened. And he goes, and we have all the, she goes, we have all the evidence on your phone, because they took my phone. 
so you don't really have to say, all you have to do is say, this is your phone, this is this. I said, I'm not. He goes, oh, you will. I said, no, I won't. She goes, you will, because with a record like yours, you'll be found in contempt of court and you'll go to prison. All right then. I said, man, do you know who Jesus is? She goes, please, I, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I said, well, that's all I have to say. And I said, God loves you so, oh, really, I'm done. Well, I'm not. God loves you so much. And I was as lost as could be. And my uncle isn't even close to as lost as I was. And God rescued me. He can rescue you too. She's like, I'm really done here, okay? And the defense attorney comes out. And I said, he goes, listen, we want a plea bargain. I know what they are because I've done them. We want to plea the case down to this. We want to drop the felonies off. Because with the felonies, he'll never be able to work and do his job again. We want to keep it as a misdemeanor, and in not one misdemeanor, and in 90 days, if he keeps his nose clean, we'll wipe his record clean. I'm like, all right, let's do that. I'm in agreement. The defense attorney assistant, now she's got an attitude, big time, especially with me, a Christian. It's called, blessed are those that are persecuted for righteousness sake. She goes, no way. He goes, why? Because, come on. This is the nephew. He was drunk. He was this. It doesn't matter. He is going down for this. Now she's got real attitude. So she's like, you know, the DA would never agree with this. He goes, well, why don't we call him? She goes, I am not calling him. Huh, guess who the DA is? The DA is the one that put me in jail. What redemption here, man. I'm thinking... Let me call him. But there's not going to know way they're going to let me call him. So he goes, why don't you let me call him? The defense attorney, she goes, go ahead. He'll never go for this. No way. So he calls. He goes, yeah. It was the uncle. He was drunk. And yup, he said some horrible things. Threatened to kill his nephew. But he was drinking and he was actually on medication, which made him hallucinate. And this, not the other thing. Either way, the nephew, he preaches the gospel and he doesn't want to press charges against his uncle. He doesn't want to even go in there with him. All right, go ahead. Cool. All right, great. Gives it to the defense, to the assistant. What? What? Get, no, sir. Yes, sir. Angry, walks into the courtroom. I'm in there, I go into the courtroom and the judge. <laughs> I've been in lots of courtrooms, but this is a good one. <laughs> And my uncle has his head hanging low. He is so condemned because of what's going on right now. He is so guilty and ashamed because of what's going on right now. And the judge, all the order, all rise, boom, and says all that stuff, you know, whatever they say. <laughs> and he's like, and the defense attorney, we're willing to, we want to give a plea and this and that and the other thing. And the judge looks over the stuff. He reads the language that's on there that he used when he threatened to kill me. Come put a bullet in my head. He goes, sir, why would you call your nephew and talk like this? As well, I was drunk. He goes, I don't want to hear you were drunk, sir. Don't tell me you were drunk. It's an excuse. Why would you have such hatred for your nephew? My uncle, my, my nephew actually preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's a really good man. And I hope that one day he would forgive me for talking like that. I said, man, I forgive you already. I forgave you. I'm not mad at you. I'm crying because he's never said he's sorry about nothing. Ever, never, ever. It's, again, it's seed of walking and living godly in front of people. Boom. When they revile you and they persecute you, that you don't let that thing affect you, but you influence them by your actions and by your life lived. So the judge looks at me. And he goes, what do you have to say? I said, can I say it? He goes, yeah, what do you believe? It? What, do you, what, what do you say about this? I said, judge, I said I was a drug addict for 22 years, and I shared my testimony there in the courtroom. The lady's taking shorthand, all that stuff. <laughs> really? I said, and I appeared before many judges, and I went to jail many times, and my life was as lost as lost could be. 
I saved mercy for my uncle because God showed me mercy. I should be dead. I got shot at from 10 feet away right here in this city. But God spared my life. And I say mercy for my uncle because if you got what you deserve, sir, you go to hell. Because Jesus paid a price for us. And you too. And you too to the defense attorney's assistant or the assistant, DA. He's so angry. And I said, Billy, I love you, man. I'm not mad at you. The judge looks at me. Is Everybody is dumbfounded. They're, they're freak. I mean, I'm talking freaked out beyond. Nobody talks like that in the courtroom. I'm hoping to provoke that so that somebody talks like this in the courtroom. Blessed are you when you're reviled and persecuted for doing good. It's commendable before the Father. <laughs> Blessed are you when people say things wrongfully about you. Blessed are you. When, when people, people make, make up, up lies about, about you and say things behind your back. back. Blessed are you when you see the hope of your calling. Blessed are you when you see the one that's blessed you. Blessed are you when you see the captain of your salvation. The one who saw you that you were the joy set before him. So he pursued the cross so that you can live free from people's accusations. Blessed are you when you don't live in the fear of man. Blessed are you when you're not bummed out when people say bad stuff about you. Blessed are you when you don't revile and persecute people back when they persecuted you first. Blessed are you when you don't pull up charges on people because they say wrong things against you. Blessed are you if you ever got fired from your job and you don't go after your employer because they came after your Christianity. Blessed are you when you give up your rights to have an attitude. Blessed are you. Just be. Just be a Christian and watch the world that you live in get turned upside down. Just be a son. Be a son. Be a daughter. Be a child of the king. Stop waiting for your time. Stop waiting for your pulpit. Let your life be your pulpit. Let your job be your mission field. What are you waiting for, church? Get up and run this race. Run the race that's been put before you. Let nobody ensnare you and hold you back. Run and live a life worthy of the call. Shine in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation. Shine as a light so that darkness gets lit up when you come in the room. Nobody can take this thing from you. They can't even kill you and take it away because to live is Christ and to die is gain. It's the truth. So the judge rules in favor of the plea. And he tells my uncle, you are not allowed to come with him so and so far for 90 days of your nephew. So we walk out of the courtroom together. He doesn't talk to me. He looks, he turns around, and he goes, you didn't have to do that. I said, I know I don't have to. I get to, man. You need a break, bro. Life has crushed you. I've walked this thing out for eight and a half years in front of you. I love you. You've watched me. I know you have. Man, I'm not asking you to say you're sorry. I just want you to know that this thing isn't given up on you. His name is Jesus. He lives inside of you. He goes, thank you for praying for me. That was it. He said, in, in three months, I'll, I'll come and see you. Three months later, at my sister's house for a birthday party. I'm over there and I hear he's coming. After 90 days, like 90 some days, I'm like, oh, he comes in the driveway. I come running outside, I'm like, comes up to me with tears in his eyes. He goes, I really love you. <laughs> Calling you up, church the reality of others. I almost ate that. I'm caught. <gasps> Choked on an angel feather. Ah! <laughs> Calling you up, church. Admonishing you. Lifting you up. Coming up underneath of you, just like Philippians 2. Considering each person is greater than myself. That I can live as an example. 
and that you would endure the suffering for the sake of God's elect. Everybody around you is the elect of God. They just don't know it yet, regardless of their response. Don't get into the whole Calvinism and Arminianism. God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever will believe. Whoever. And people will believe because you believe. People will come to the King because you represent Him well. I heard Bill Johnson say, Jesus is the head and the church is His body. And if we represent the head well, they'll want His body. It is awesome. Guys, we have a job to do. The job that we have to do is to be like Jesus. Nobody stops you but you. That was a roller coaster ride, huh? You are 
told me that you are unoffendable. He's purifying his bride. He's purifying his bride. The blood is coursing through our veins. Until nothing remains. Nothing remains but Christ in us, the hope of glory. Jesus, Jesus, you were worthy, worthy. Jesus, Jesus, you were worthy, worthy. Jesus, Jesus, you are holy, holy. You are. Blessed lives, worthy of the call. Let us walk in the midst of a perverse and corrupt generation. Who will shine as lights? We shine as lights, light lighting up the darkness. Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, 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 you are worthy. You are holy. We are not afraid. We're in Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, you are worthy. And whom shall we fear? Whom shall we fear? You are for us. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. He might raise up sons and daughters, raise up sons and daughters in an army that's undefeatable, in an army that's undefeatable. Because we are not afraid, because we are not alone, because He is worthy. Worthy of all praise. Mighty is our Lord, our God, to save. 